Good morning and welcome to Walking with Jesus Through the Word, one chapter per day. I am Pastor Jason Van Bemmel from Forest Hill Presbyterian Church. It's day 583 of our three-year journey through the Word of God, and we come to Hebrews chapter 10. Got my mug full of coffee here. Drink coffee. Do stupid things faster with more energy. Hopefully, we'll do a not stupid thing, a very smart thing of spending time in God's Word with more energy. Let's pray and ask the Lord's help, though, because we need the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of a new day and the gift of your Word. It is a treasure and a blessing to us every day of our lives. Would you write your word on our hearts that we might be guided by your spirit, that we might walk in the ways of truth for the glory of your name in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, It can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins? But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said the above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brothers... Since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth... There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. 
Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much more punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison. And you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay, But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. That is Hebrews chapter 10. It's a long chapter, and it is a very, very important chapter. In many ways, it is is the climax. I think Chapter 7, 8 is kind of the centerpiece, and chapter 10 is kind of the climax, and chapter 11 is going to going to uh, spell this out even more. But this is the argument that's been building for, for several chapters here in the heart of Hebrews on how Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament sacrificial law, the ceremonial law, because of the once-for-all sacrifice that he offered. So some of this we've heard before, and I'm not going to necessarily spend a super long time on it, but it is very important. The earthly Mosaic law, the ceremonial law, the sacrificial law, the priesthood sacrifice system of the Mosaic law was a shadow. It, the, the, the earthly sanctuary, whether that's the tabernacle or the temple or the second temple, there were three, the earthly tabernacle, the first temple built by Solomon, the second temple uh, built after the exile and then expanded by King Herod, whichever of those three we're talking about, they're not the real heavenly sanctuary. They were made as a copy according to the pattern that was shown Moses on the mountain. They were a good, faithful copy. They were an instructional tool, right? But they're not the actual reality itself. When I was teaching my oldest son how to drive, one of the benefits that he had in learning to drive is that he had been cutting our grass using our riding mower. The riding mower was a good model for learning how to drive, but it wasn't actually driving a car on a real road at speed and things like that. So there was was some parallels. It was a good teaching tool, but it wasn't the real deal. And that's the same thing with the earthly sanctuary and the earthly sacrifices. And so he says, it is impossible, verse 4, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. They, the, the worshipers under the Old Testament Mosaic Law were never cleansed. And so, the author of Hebrews here quotes from Isaiah 40, in basically saying, sacrifice and offerings are not what God ultimately wants. These animal sacrifices, these offerings, they are teaching tools, but they're not the ultimate end game. And so, what is the real goal is the body prepared for Christ. The body prepared for Christ, in which he comes to do the will of God as it is written in the scroll of the book. And what is that that he does? A once for all sacrifice. Now you see three verses here on the screen, or three and a half verses here on the screen highlighted. Um, These are just highlights that I had from a previous time when I was teaching through Hebrews. but, But they're highlighted for a reason, because they're centrally important in this book. He does away with the first. There are some people within Christianity who are really eager to see a temple rebuilt in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. Why? 
that that's been done away with that's been set aside it's been fulfilled it's been replaced by that to which it was always pointing it never had salvific effect it never saved anyone so he does away with the first covenant in order to establish the second he does away with the first sacrificial system in order to establish the second the final sacrifice and that is the the offering of the body of jesus christ once for all when christ offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins he sat down other priests under the old covenant system never sat down. He sat down because his work was finished. He sat on the cross. It is finished. To Tetelestai, paid in full, finished, completed, done, settled, account settled. There's not a single sin that will be held against you on judgment day because Jesus has already paid for them all. Verse 14 is one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible. By a single offering, he has perfected for all time, those who are being sanctified. If Christ Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and if you are in the process of being sanctified, if you're growing in holiness by faith in Jesus Christ, if you are a true believer, then you have been perfected for all time before the throne of God by this once for all sacrifice of Christ. He's done the work. And that's why the New Covenant promise, after it says, I'm going to write the law on their hearts and minds, he says, I'm going to remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. No more. There's no need for any more offering for sin. The Catholic system of penance, of, oh, you've sinned, now you need to do these acts of penance. That's not in the Bible. You do need to repent. That's a change in your mindset, a change in your outlook that's wrought in you, worked in you by the Holy Spirit. But doing penance to try to somehow atone for your sins, that's nonsense. It's not biblical, and it, it undermines the once for all, single offering, perfected for all time, those who are being sanctified. Now, with that in mind, we come to the second half of the chapter, which is kind of the scary half, right? First half of Hebrews chapter 10, very reassuring, very confidence-inspiring, very helpful, good gospel truth. The second half is a warning and a stern warning, but we can't forget the first half when we come to the second half. What do I mean by that? Well, some people approach the second half of Hebrews 10 and they say, um, is he talking about real believers, genuine, born-again, blood-bought saints, children of God, who could then lose their salvation? Is that what he's talking about? No, that can't be what he's talking about because if Christ has died for your sins once for all, and if the benefits of his redemption have been applied to your soul through faith that God has worked in you, saving faith, you are already perfected for all time. For all time. It's not going to be undone. Christ is not going to undie for your sins. The Holy Spirit's not going to unapply the benefits of redemption to you. But the sober warning still needs to be heard because the sober warning is a warning to us that those who fall away, those who do not hold fast the confession of their hope, those who neglect and drift and fall away and commit apostasy, they were never truly saved in the first place. That's the truth. And this is what's meant in verse 26 when it says, if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. He's not talking about just the ordinary sin that remains as a remnant in the life of a believer. He's talking about sinning deliberately here is willful sin with a refusal to repent. So if you are, let's say you are a serial adulterer and you are committing adultery on an ongoing basis and you're confronted 
and called out for that and you say, oh, leave me alone. I don't care. No big deal. I'm going to keep doing it. Or let's say that you're a thief and you you go around snatching purses and picking pockets and robbing convenience stores and someone says to you, this is terrible. You can't do this and be a Christian. It's incompatible. You say, leave me alone. I'm going to go on sinning deliberately and unrepentantly. That is incompatible with a credible profession of faith. That is incompatible with someone who is being sanctified and thus is someone for whom Christ has died and perfected you for all time. We need to take seriously the call to holiness, not of sinless perfection. See, Christians usually fall into one ditch or the other, the sort of perfectionistic ditch that says you can get to the point where you never ever sin at all, right? Or the licentious ditch, which says you can just keep on sinning deliberately and it doesn't really matter because Jesus paid it all and you're going to be good to go. Sign, sealed, delivered, it's done, right? Well, if it is signed, sealed, delivered, and done, then your heart will be changed. You will have a sincere faith in Jesus and you will desire to please him from the heart. You will not be callous about sin. And if you are deliberately and repeatedly callous about sin, then there may be cause to say, have I really trusted in Jesus? Have I really understood and received the salvation that is found in Jesus? Or am I just making a show of my Christianity? And what is definitely not okay is to fall away and to deny Christ and to leave his people and to reject your profession of faith and to say, I'm just not going to have anything to do with it because then where are you going to go for a sacrifice for sins? Where are you going to go to be cleansed and forgiven and reconciled to God? However, the author of Hebrews, as he did in chapter 6, he comes back here in chapter 10 and says, um, there's good evidence that you really did have saving faith and that therefore you really do have saving faith. He's hopeful because earlier they struggled, they suffered, they were exposed to reproach and affliction. They were, they were sometimes partnered with those. They had compassion on those who were imprisoned for their faith. They even joyfully accepted the plundering of their property, knowing that they had a better possession and an abiding one. So there is a reason for them to have confidence that they really do belong to Jesus. Their treasure really is in heaven. And so don't throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. You do need to press on in the faith. You do need to persevere in the faith. Again, we're not talking about sinless perfection here, but we're talking about the perseverance of the saints, which is not the perseverance of the ain'ts. Okay? If you ain't persevering, then you ain't a saint because the saints persevere by the grace of God, kept in the confidence of saving faith, which has been given by the grace of God. And so he ends on a positive note. We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Those who belong to Jesus Christ, those whose sins have been forgiven, those whose hearts have been renewed, those who are raised with Christ and seated with him in the heavenly places, to use the language of Ephesians 2, will not be lost but they also will not fail to show fruit in their lives that is in keeping with the transformation they have received. Let's pray. Father, your grace alone, through Jesus Christ, our Savior alone, received by faith alone, is what saves us. Jesus is the one who has paid it all. It is finished. Father, as we've received Christ, may we walk in him. May we hold fast our confidence of our hope to the end. May we not be of those who shrink back, but of those who persevere and so show that we are saved. For we are yours. Thank you for the once for all sacrifice of your son. We praise you in Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. That's Hebrews chapter 10. Thanks for joining me. Tomorrow we'll be back in Second Chronicles. Have a blessed day in the Lord. Amen.